in the preceding video. I questioned the validity of the great man theory. What I found was that some composers were significantly different from other composers, but the difference does not necessarily equate with greatness. What greatness does mean, I think, is that those things that we consider to be great contain more of what we value than those things that we don't. So if we are to come to grips with this, we need to determine what it is that we value about music. When, as a child, I first discovered classical music, I raided my father's record collection. What I found was a box set labeled 50 Greatest Classical Masterpieces. I thought I'd hit the jackpot. I reasoned that this set must contain all of the truly great classical music, and that I needed to look no further. I put on the first record and was soon disappointed. This collection contained only the themes from various pieces. Each track was maybe 30 seconds to a minute long. Just as I was starting to enjoy a piece, it was over. The assumption made by the compilers of this set was that the truly valuable part of a musical composition was its theme. Let's test this assumption by looking at a sonata by Clementi. This opening theme should sound familiar. It is similar to the theme from Mozart's Magic Flute Overture. Clementi, being a lesser of still accomplished composer, must have stolen it from Mozart. But he didn't. Mozart took the theme from Clementi. In 1781, Mozart and Clementi engaged in a musical competition at the court of Joseph II in Vienna. Clementi's B-flat sonata is supposed to have been one of the pieces on the program, and we assume that Mozart heard it at that concert. Clementi was aware of Mozart's borrowing. He himself made a piano reduction of the Magic Flute Overture and sold it through his music publishing company. Clementi was arguably not as good a composer as Mozart, but he was a much better businessman. So if great themes are what's needed to make great music, the Clementi Sonata should be just as good as the Mozart, or maybe better, because Clementi originated the theme. I think most musicians would rank the Clementi below the Mozart because of how Clementi develops the theme. In fact, he doesn't develop it much at all. The sonata opens with the first measure of the familiar theme. Clementi sequences it a few times, then ends the phrase with a plagal cadence. The following phrases complete his first theme. They are not closely related to the magic flute theme nor is the going to music that follows. Clementi's second theme combines the original idea with the descending scale. Some theorists have claimed that this sonata doesn't actually have a second theme. I disagree. The second theme just starts out the same way as the first theme, but it continues differently. It's in the dominant key, and it is self-contained with definite cadences. This second theme is kind of similar to Mozart's second theme, which also contains the opening of the first theme and makes use of a descending scale or arpeggio. Here's Mozart's second theme in the recap of the Magic Flute Overture. The going to music after the second theme is again not related to the theme. The theme crops up briefly at the start of the development. The development then continues with a 16th note figure that's probably derived from the end of the theme. So in the Clementi, this idea happens at the start of the first and second themes, and at the start of the development. Just as we saw in the previous video, Mozart develops the theme extensively. He uses it in a fugal exposition. He uses it in a development section. He slices it, he dices it, he combines it with other material. My point is that while musicians today can appreciate a catchy theme, we value more highly how that theme is developed. 
that isn't to say that music isn't often based on repeated patterns, but rather that what we value most is the elaboration of these patterns rather than the patterns themselves. A good case in point is Bachabel's famous canon. It's a set of variations, and it's fun to follow one variation into the next. A variations has to be based on something, and in this case that something is a bass line and a chord progression. Look at the original manuscript. Notice that the bass part is written only once. Since it keeps repeating, there's no reason to write it out again and again. There's a chord progression that's associated with this bass part, and that appears when all three violins have finally entered. This harmonic pattern is not something Pachelbel invented. It is a standard pattern known as a partimento. This particular partimento has the bass pattern down a fourth of a second repeat. Other patterns might go down a fifth and up a fourth, or down a fourth and then up a fifth. Each bass pattern has a series of chords and voices associated with it. Here is the pattern of chords associated with this part of Minto, as found in Fidele Finaroli's textbook. Notice that with the exception of one note, all of the violins contain the same notes as the voices in the Finaroli. The chord is, however, in a different voicing. This too is covered in the Finaroli. His method includes three different positions of the hand, one with the fifth on the top, one with the third, and one with the root of the chord on the top. This idea that chord voicings correspond to positions of the keyboard player's hand gives us a clue as to how partimenti were used. They were used in keyboard improvisation and keyboard composition. The most basic partimento pattern is known as the rule of the octave. Here's the rule of the octave, ascending in major from Finaroli's book. There is very little concern here with traditional voice leading. The idea is that chords need to fit easily under the keyboard player's fingers. Now, let's look at the rule of the octave descending. Notice that this partimento pattern contains a chromatic. There's a secondary dominant going into the chord built on the dominant scale degree. How does Finaroli explain this chromatic? He doesn't. Partimento is not that kind of music theory. It doesn't offer explanations, only patterns. Finaroli students learned the patterns, and they were required to always play them in the same way, without asking questions. The descending form of the minor rule of the octave is even more interesting. The chord leading into the fifth scale degree is an augmented sixth chord, a French sixth. I didn't learn about French sixth chords until my second year of music theory in college. And here's Finaroli introducing them in the most basic partimento, the rule of the octave. It's a complicated concept to introduce so early in a student's education. Finaroli didn't think of it that way. It was just a pattern to be learned and used verbatim. Vestiges of the partimento system are alive and well in jazz education today. Jazz students are often taught formulas and patterns they can use in their improvisations. Sophisticated jazz listeners criticize students who use these patterns without transcending them. They call these students pattern players. Similar descriptions are found in 18th century descriptions of improvisatory practice. While some musicians apparently never transcended their partimento training, I believe that others did. In order to demonstrate this, I've looked for partimento patterns lurking in the background of music by famous composers. For example, I've always been struck by Beethoven's use of an augmented sixth chord in his Bagatelle Op. 19 No. 1. It seems unnecessary, a kind of hardly noticeable throwaway gesture. While it seems strange to me, I bet it didn't to Beethoven. It's based on the partimento, the rule of the octave, in minor. If we think like a partimentist, we will see everything in music as a pattern. We will see music as a constant recycling of the same patterns. Functional harmony is similar to partimento. It's a way of describing recurring musical patterns. It's based on this partimento bass line. Much music theory, like Neo-Riemannian theory and Schenkerian theory, is based on patterns. But what is truly valuable in music is not the patterns themselves, but how they are used, combined, and developed. This is what music theory should really be about. And this is what analysis should really be about. However, if we are to get to the bottom of what is valuable in music through analysis, we must get rid of most of music's non-essential elements. This is, in fact, what analysis is all about, reducing a complex process to a simpler one. This brings me back to Howard Becker and his idea that art is a collaborative process. 
Beethoven. As great a composer as he was, he didn't perpetrate his compositions alone. He had, still has, accomplices. Composers need performers and conductors to bring their work to life. They also need publishers and publicists, copiers and stationers. They need concert hall architects and builders, ushers and ticket takers. A performance of a piece by Beethoven is a tangled web of social interactions. But how much of that social interaction actually affects the music itself? I know, music is a social phenomenon. It's a kind of a communication between people. But as a music theorist, I'm not concerned about the senders and receivers. I'm concerned about the message. I'm concerned about the music itself. So if we want to study the music itself, we can get rid of the ushers and the ticket takers, the concert hall architects, and the acoustical consultants. We can even get rid of the performers, because music exists independently of any particular performance. It exists as a score. The importance of musical scores was highlighted on music critic composer Paul Morley's BBC program, How to Be a Composer. The series followed Morley as he attended the Royal Academy of Music in London, where he attempted to find out what it took to be a composer. Morley was an accomplished musician. He had been in the group The Art of Noise, but he could not read music. Since scores are traditional and somewhat old-fashioned, there was some discussion when he first entered the Royal Academy about whether composers still needed to be able to read musical scores. It was decided that they did, Morley recounts how learning to read music changed his life and his understanding of music. In an interview, he said, I fell in love with the score within weeks, didn't I? It's this kind of quasi-literary artifact that was transmitting all of this incredible thinking and therefore became the most modern thing imaginable. It is not perhaps fashionable to describe a work as a musical score. Some works don't even have scores. For example, a folk song might exist only in performance. However, it is possible to transcribe performances into scores. Many people object to this practice. A transcription can leave out details that are important to a performer. But analysis is about stripping music back to its essence. That's exactly what a transcription does. About 15 years ago, I stopped using orchestral scores in my analysis class and started using piano reductions instead. This has worked beautifully. A piano reduction is already a proto-analysis. It only includes the most important elements. It's also a boon to online teaching. Given the size of the screens on our devices, full orchestral scores are simply unreadable. Practical considerations aside, I would argue that piano reductions contain most of the musical elements of most musical compositions, and a bit more besides. My point is that there is a concept that embodies the piece, and that that concept is itself pretty compact. That concept is the piece. It is the music itself. My brother is a lawyer and a law professor, and he once wrote a book entitled Think Like a Lawyer. This is a very effective title, even if it was inspired by a catchphrase from a novel, a film, and a television show. If I were really being honest about my approach, I would have called this series of videos Think Like a Composer, because that's what I am, and that's how I think, and that's how I teach. I'm not alone in this. Most music theory books were written for composers by composers. I'm talking about the Rameau book and the Kernberger book, the Weber, the Hindemith, and the Talk. George Russell's book was probably written for improvisers, but improvisers also think like composers. Even Riemann and Schinker were composers, even though their theories might suggest otherwise. The final videos in this series will be personal. In them, I will tell you how I think and how I work. We spend a lot of time in academia talking about objectivity, but I think many times that objectivity is just a smokescreen, covering up the fact that we're actually teaching from our own experience. We teach the students to think as we think.